and we're live. So uh, the first question we have is, hey guys, I do SEO consulting. I want to know of any good suggestions on where to find good writers to write five to six blog posts a month that are 1,000 to 2,000 words per article. What's the going rate for this? Sure, you ideally want to write 2,000 word articles. 1,000 is a bit on the short end. The average post that ranks on page one of Google is roughly 2,200 words. Uh, so when you write 1,000 word blog posts, it's harder to get a ranking because it's not about just word length, it's about thoroughness, and it's hard to make really short articles super thorough. So for that reason, I would recommend writing 2,000 plus word articles. The, and as for where to get them, I would check out jobs.problogger.net. You can get tons of amazing writers for them. Uh, and they're quite affordable, right? Uh, you can end up getting a really good writer for somewhere between 100 to $200 a post. And you're probably more so looking at the $200 range for a 2,200-word blog post. Now, when you get these writers, and if you want high quality, you need to give them some rules. So the first rule is make them write in a conversational tone. If they use the words you and I, you're better off than if they don't use those words because then it won't seem as a conversation. Second, their paragraph shouldn't be longer than five or six uh, lines. Uh, if they're longer than that, it makes it hard to like skim. Uh, third, they need to use subheadings. Uh, and again, this just makes it easier to skim. Also gives you more opportunities to place in keywords. Mm -hmm. Fourth, they need to wrap up the post with a conclusion. And fifth, they need to end the post with a question because the question creates more comments and going back to the conclusion, a lot of people scroll down when they first land on a blog post, read the conclusion, and then scroll back up and see if they want to read the rest of the post. Wonderful. That is pretty awesome. Uh, are there any other resources apart from ProBlogger you'd use to find writers? The ProBlogger job board is the best, and then after you hire the writer, they submit their work. Take it, upload it to a random HTML page. This isn't a page you want indexed in Google. And then mm -hmm. submit that to copyscape.com, and it'll tell you if they plagiarized or not. Perfect. Awesome. Um, next question actually comes from email. So what type of email outreach templates do you usually use when you're outreaching with someone? So cold outreach, you're trying to get links from them, you're trying to write for them. What type of uh, templates do you usually use? And what's your strategy and how do you think about outreach just on a big picture spectrum? So you're saying just in general, how do I think about outreach? Yeah, one of the questions was they're thinking about doing outreach and they're not sure where to start, how to think about it, and so on. Well, uh, with outreach, the, the thing is, is like when or do they have context on when they want to do outreach, or are they just saying uh, they're starting to do it right now, since they joined the course? Sure. So when you're doing outreach, it really comes down to how can you go out there and you know target people who would want to share your content or link to it. So here's the simplest way I like doing outreach. And I do it in a few different phases and steps. So let's say I write a blog post and I link out to 10 people. I'll email out every single one and I'll do something like, hey Vignesh, I gotta say I'm a huge fan of your work. So much so that I even linked out to you my latest blog post. Um, you know, feel free to check it out here. If you like it, feel free and share it. Cheers, Neil. It's that simple. When I do that, a percentage of those people will share the blog post. Gets me good social traffic. The next form of outreach that I like doing is I see who links to my competitor articles, you know, using Brian Dean's skyscraper technique. So let's say someone wrote an article like 10 ways to boost your traffic, and I wrote my article, which is 101 ways to boost your traffic, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, hey, Vignesh, I noticed you shared an article called 10 ways to boost your search traffic by Jared Mitchell. I have a similar article coming up, but mine's 101 ways to boost your search traffic. Feel free to check it out here, and if you like it, feel free and uh, link to it. Cheers, Neil. 
Uh, that okay. simple, right? Or instead of linking, you can ask them to share it, whatever it may be. So if they've shared someone else's article, like, and you can find out who shared your competitor's article using BuzzSumo and putting their URL there, or Twitter search and putting their URL there. And if you can't find people's email address, use hunter.io. That's hunter.io. And then lastly, you know, you can just see what's working and what's not working by, um, what, what is it called? And then you can also use Ahrefs to see who links to your competitor articles and then also go from there. Okay, noted. Well, one more question that it was in the same email was they were wondering response times and response uh, rates in terms of, so if they email out 100 people, how many people do you expect to reply? How many people do you say would link to you? And how many of those would turn into? Yeah, Links-wise, you should get at least like 4 or 5% linking to you. Response rates, you should get you know well above 10 to 20%. Uh, social shares, you should get about 10% sharing your content. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. Uh, the, the stuff you tell me, you know, there's stuff that I've never heard personally. <laughs> so I can take a lot of notes of that, you know, everything you say. So, yeah. And I do actually sometimes when you're talking because <laughs> I can implement it for Dan and all these other clients. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, Jared, uh, next question is just a personal question for me uh, that we just can talk about, which is how you manage your company in Basecamp 3. Like, you, you have that pretty dialed down. You have, like, 30 people on there, and I can see every day tasks are just happening. So, Jared, do you want to talk about how you manage your 8 million dollar e-commerce business? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Yeah, um... <clears throat> for me, like managing the company, like doing it in a really efficient way where I can do it from anywhere in the world is super important because we have two kids and we have 15 employees and one of our kids is special needs. And so my wife and I are really close and, um, you know, we want our kids to remember us as around and <laughs> present. And um, we also like to travel with them, you know. so. Um, let's see, a while ago, Neil hooked me up with a client um, that was also looking for a project management software tool. And, um, you know, I've had experience with Skype, Slack, um, gosh, Trello, uh, Basecamp, you know, like Skype, did I already say? <laughs> the list goes on. So, um, you know, one thing that always annoyed me is like having to use six different tools for something. And so I did a bunch of research and um, found out that Basecamp was launching a new uh, system called Basecamp 3 that the whole goal was to, you know, replace everything, like basically do what I was looking for. So I reached out to him and it was really weird, but it just so happened that the founder, Jason Freed, I think his name is, was a fan of one of the companies that I was consulting. And so he actually agreed to put us on beta and got on a video chat with me and explained how it all worked. <laughs> so um, that probably helped, you know. But, um, yeah, we ended up going with Basecamp 3, and it's great because it, it essentially replaces everything uh, from calendars to, you know, just Skype type of chats to being able to do internal communication. So we don't even email each other now. We just use Basecamp 3 for everything, and I love it. Hey, um, how do you usually give someone a task, and how do you monitor it, and how do you get it done? Because I see like a hundred different things happen on your base camp every day. <laughs> yeah, well, due dates are due dates are huge, you know. So how we use base camp three is I assign each employee their own base camp, and each employee handles a certain task, you know. So like we were just talking about content marketing. So my gal who does my writing and manages my content marketing, her name is Brianna, and she puts a funny picture up of herself and the nickname, so we call it Brianna Banana, and we make it fun. And so essentially underneath um, Brianna's base camp, her personal one, her content marketing base camp, we create um, to-do lists. And whenever we get a to-do, whether she assigns it to herself or whether I assign it to her, we tag each other. 
and we determine a due date that's acceptable and essentially save it. And basically, Basecamp gives her a report as an employee of when tasks are due. So she can go uh, onto the system every day and see, you know, what's coming up, what she needs to finish. And I, as an admin, can actually go in and do a report that kind of like shows me everything like that's due from all of my employees, kind of like you saw, Vignesh. So there's like <laughs> 100 things each day. But mm -hmm. uh, it's the best way that I've found. I mean, maybe Neil knows of something better, but it's the best way that I've found uh, to manage my staff at this size at this time. Awesome. Uh, now, a question for you next then. So what is your, uh, because SEO is complex and there's hundreds of moving parts and you know a lot of things need to be done on a day-to-day -day basis, so how do you manage it? You know, and what tool do you use and how do you go about doing it? You can you repeat it, Vignesh? The question was, SEO is complex and there's hundreds of different things that, that need to happen, everything from checking ranks, like checking positions and this, that, and the other, and checking links and checking pretty much a lot of different things, and you have so many different businesses and different websites that you manage. How do you do all of it, just from an SEO perspective? Well, it, it seems overwhelming at first, but as you do anything for a while, you get better at it and you learn how to streamline it. Uh, and I also have help, right? We have like so many people within our company. But the big thing is, is like, you don't do everything. And that's a misconception. Everyone thinks you do everything, but you really don't. You pick, you know, on a daily basis, I break them down into tasks. You know, what are the one or two tasks that I can do for just today that'll help impact the business? And that's how I break everything down. It's just pretty much based on daily tasks. Okay, awesome. Uh, that's pretty epic. And I know that you and David were working on Trello. Is that your preferred ma method of managing content? It's Output? David's method. I myself don't okay. log into Trello, but David does. So uh, it works really well for him, and I've seen it. It's very streamlined. I see. Okay. Um, another question that also came through like a couple days ago, actually, in private chat was, what's the most valuable content marketing lesson that you've ever learned just by doing this for so many years? Quantity wins. If you look at the people who write the best quality content, they may have more loyal readers, but the people who write in quantity tend to get the most traffic and generate the most income. I see. It doesn't matter if the quantity is mediocre, quantity always wins. Mm, I see. Okay, that is uh, really amazing to hear. Um, next question is just something uh, that I was thinking about and Jared was thinking about. What are uh, some experiments that you're running right now that you'd be willing to share with us? Sure. So I tested out an experiment where I removed the video from the Neil Patel homepage, uh, and that increased my conversions by a bit more than 28%. It's kind of crazy, you know, thinking that video and explaining what you can do uh, can hurt the conversion rates. I've been testing uh, breaking up uh, form fields based on like multiple steps. So I've always told people, hey, two-step form fields increase your conversions by 10%, but now I'm trying like three or four-step form fields, and I'm finding that to increase conversions even more, which is kind of cool. So um, those are the main tests that I'm running. I don't have significance on the last tests, on the form fields. So far it's looking like it'll be like a 15-16% increase, but it's not statistically significant. Right now it's a 90 plus percent lift, or I mean it's a 90% plus statistical significance, but I need it to hit 99% before I can call it a winner. I see. Uh, how long do you run a test usually? I run tests for at least one week. And the reason being is Sundays aren't the same as Mondays, etc. right? Nights aren't the same as mornings. So you need at least one full week so you can get every day of the week in there. I make sure there's at least 100 conversions per variation. And I make sure that the winner has a 99% statistical significance. If it doesn't, then it could change and the lift may not be a lift. 
Okay, amazing. Um, Jared, you had also Skyped me about uh, the tests you were running. Do you want to share some of those? Yeah, sure. Um, my tests are mostly econ related, you know. So for those of you who are selling things over a shopping cart, um, these would probably apply a little bit more to you. Um, let's see. So I got I, I love testing. I got super into it after I saw Mr. Neil Patel speak at an Optimizely conference for the first time. And um, let's see. I think the most profitable test we've ever run was we were able to set up a test uh, on our cart uh, checkout page where um, for years we had always, always, always offered free shipping on all orders. And as soon as we started doing that, and I highly recommend that, or at least starting your business that way, it always increases conversion. But we came to a point where we'd reached a certain size where we really were diving into our numbers and we determined that orders under $25 were not that profitable for us and kind of just spinning our wheels. So um, we decided to run a test where we forced half of our traffic to pay for shipping if the order was under $25. And so what was really cool is actually um, the, the portion of the traffic that was paying for their shipping, uh, it actually won out. It increased our conversion rate and increased our average order size. So it was kind of weird, but now we charge shipping on orders that are under $25, and that was a huge victory for us because essentially it raised our average order size, but also we're making money on those orders that are under $25 now. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then another big one for us, um, actually for any e-commerce cart, if you've never tested your add to cart button color or add to bag, you can even test the, the verbiage and the design of it. Um, I mean, I'd do so right away. Um, the, the test is a little tricky to set up, but you're, I, I've never run a test before that I didn't get clear results. And it was so weird, but for whatever reason, <laughs> Red, which generally is like the worst color to use for an add to cart button, won out for my company and it increased our conversion rate quite a bit. So I could talk all day about tests that we've ran or we're running, but I think those are two that pop out for me right off the bat. Awesome, Jared. Thank you for sharing. Um, Jared, would you like to ask the question I put on? Uh on Hangout for you real quick to Neil because uh, I think we were going to ask him that. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. So this comes from one of our clients, uh, Neil, and um, let's see here. Basically he says, and this guy has some pretty good rankings for some pretty big keywords, I'd say, and he's been around a while. Um, but his question is, um, any idea why his top three or top four through ten positions would uh, sort of contract over the last three to five months? Um, their indexation has grown considerably. Like, um, they've done a lot more content, built out a lot more pages, grown as a website. Um, so he's wondering, you know, is Google just refactoring things or is you know, are all the new pages that he's building possibly diluting, you know, his uh, top rankings? So the adding more pages don't dilute your top rankings. There's something that's causing your rankings to fluctuate and change. In many cases, it can be things like your top competitors building more links or them increasing how many brand signals that people are getting, right? Because they look at things like that. Like sometimes people with more brand signals do better. What you have to end up seeing is what are your other players doing that you're not doing? So I would take all of their URLs, put them into Ahrefs, and see if they're getting more backlinks. If they are, you know, that could be a reason. If they're not, then you need to look at, all right, you know, have they been updating their content? If they haven't, then, you know, why are your rankings dropping? And usually, from everything that I've tested, it has to deal with people just not having their content as thorough because Google making, you know, changes on the content end. Or it also has to deal with um, brand queries in which other 
more people are searching for your competitor's brand name, and that really drastically helps boost rankings. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. That is awesome. Um, uh, one thing that I can say about their competitors are their competitors are putting out content every three three articles a day is on average what they're putting out. Uh, the client right here is putting out an article every day now, so 30 articles a month, give or take. Got it. Yeah, it has an impact, right? It's just a question of, you know, it, it's it, well, it's not even about content. So if you put out a lot of content, your rankings go up, but your rankings go up like in six to 12 months from that content. But the big mm -hmm. thing is, is like, are you getting social shares? Are you getting brand recognition? I found that brand queries, like people start typing in your brand name, impacts rankings more than anything else by far. I see. I see. Awesome. Uh, we also have like two more questions that are completely relevant to what we're talking about with the customers. So there have been some queries about on the Facebook group. Some people have sent us questions like, now that I'm in the course, uh, my website's outdated. Uh, what are things I should be doing? Should I redesign my website? How am I supposed to approach it? So that was a question that you don't came redesign through. The, yeah, you don't want to redesign your website. You want to continually make tweaks because then you can A-B test them. If you have very little traffic, sure, you can redesign your website. But don't redesign it based on what you want. Redesign it based on user feedback and surveying because the moment you make a design based on what you think looks cool or any of that, your numbers can just tank. And that's why I prefer making tweaks and continually A-B testing. And then eventually I end up with the new design, right, because all those changes add up. I see. So continually changing a couple percentage points every week and then over a couple month period that adds up into a new design. Exactly. Awesome. Um, another question that came through was, um, I'm brand new and I am starting from a pretty much new domain. What's the best advice I can get for building brand authority and increasing my rankings? So the best way is to create content on social media. What I found is social media increases brand awareness more than anything else. So you want to end up creating content, you know, like blog posts that people want to share on the social web, like ultimate guides, quotes uh, with, you know, your brand name on them. It, it's anything that just has your brand name out there and seeing it multiple times. Think about like Nike. You know, Nike's not going out there and just being like, hey, everyone, Google Nike. They just have so many TV commercials and so many athletes wearing their stuff. It's just built up their brand awareness over the years. I see. Um, does working with influencers help or aid in that realm? Like when you're just getting started, like tagging on along with an influencer to kind of create content, is that a good strategy? Yeah, you'd say? That's a great strategy as well. The problem with influencer marketing is is it's getting more and more expensive but yeah it does definitely work hey that's pretty much all the questions we had by email and by chat and pretty much in the last couple of weeks uh, the only one is just a follow-up to the other one which is if I've actually changed my website and I've lost a majority of my traffic due to some reason, what's the best advice I can get in terms of getting my rankings back, such as I've been hit with the Panda update or uh, I've just changed something that I shouldn't and then rankings drop. Like, what is the best advice we can give someone to get that back, you'd say? So you lost rankings from, like, a penalty and you're figuring out how to recover? Mm-hmm. So you go to, you Google Moz Algo Change. It has a list. See the exact date in which your traffic dropped. When your traffic dropped during that date, look what that update was. They have a brief description. And let's say if it was a link update, then go through your links and disavow the junk ones. If it's a content update, then go through all your content and try to improve the quality, right? So you just want to go through them step by order by order and then just reverse what the algo change was. We have to first figure out why you got hit. So. Awesome. And usually it takes a couple months to 
regain the traffic it right now? That's correct. It takes two to three months. Awesome. Um, that's pretty much all the questions I had. I don't think um, we have any more questions from the audience yet. So, yeah, that's pretty much all we have for today then. Sounds good. The group in the meantime. Okay, thank you guys. Um, we'll see you soon.